Okay, church. This morning, I am going to read to you, how do you think you're gonna manage this? I know it's early morning in London, but I'm going to read to you 20 verses. <laughs> do you think you can manage 20 verses? Yes, who thinks they can manage 20 verses? I read them fast, but not too fast. And if we read them together, they're very inspiring verses. I'm going to read to us from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is this book in the Bible about how a man called Nehemiah was raised up after um, the book of Ezra. And the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and the people were not able to worship the true and living God in the way that they should have been able to worship Him. And so Nehemiah was raised up actually to restore true worship to the people of Israel. And so this story of Nehemiah is a 75 year old problem. These walls had been broken down and no one had been able to restore them. And then God raises up this man called Nehemiah and he sends him in and he's going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to protect the people and change the nation. Okay, so it's a big problem and it's an impossible problem to change. Everybody on the page? So we're gonna pick up the story in Nehemiah chapter four. 20 verses. Are we ready? Okay, it says, Sam Ballot was very angry when he learned that they were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and he mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? Do they think that they can build a wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think that they can... Um, make something of stone from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah and the Ammonite who was standing beside him remarked, the stone wall would collapse if even a fox would walk along the top of it. But then I prayed, hear us, O God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt and do not blot out their sins for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But then Sambalat, the Tobiah and the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashrodites heard that the work was going ahead and the gaps of the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired and they were furious they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. And then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before you know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and we will kill them and we will end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy camp came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and they will attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest part of the wall to the inexposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families. I armed the swords, the spears. I, I armed them with swords, spears and bows. And then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. And when our enemies heard that we knew of their plans, that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half the men worked while the other half stood guard with spears and shields and bows and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting the load and one hand holding the weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side and the trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. And then I explained to the nobles and the officials and all the people, the work is very spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding and then God will fight for us. And everybody said, 
Amen. Well done, church. 20 verses. I want to take us back to verse 14. So you hear they stepped out to do something good. The enemy came in. Criticism, attack, challenge, obstacles, trying to annihilate them. But they kept going. Then we go to verse 14 and it says this. Then as I, I looked over the situation, I called to weather, together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. I wanna say this to our church. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Don't be afraid of the enemy, but fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives and fight for your homes. And do you know church this morning, I don't have a sermon title, but I do have a sermon question. And my question to all of us today, and we've got to ask our own heart, this question, do you still have the fight in you? Do you still have the fight in you, church? I wanna ask you that, do you still have the fight in you? I understand in this passage at the end, it says God fights for us. I understand that. But I know, and I know this, I understand that God fights for us. I understand that victory is always in Him. I understand, church, that we are more than conquerors. And I also understand that we are overcomers. And I understand that no weapon formed against us is able to prosper. And I also understand that we are the head and we are not the tail. But church, I also understand that God always partners with people to, God always partners with people to fulfill His purpose. And I wanna say to our church today, God is partnering with you in 2024 to fulfil His purpose in your life and in our cities and in our nations. And I believe church, this church, our church, the church that we call home, we are called to disciple nations. We are called to change lives. We are called to transform cities and God always partners with people. And so my question to our church today is, do you still have the fight in you? Do you have the fight in you for what's ahead? Do you have, still have the fight in you for 2024? Do, are you starting the year? And if you, if you hear that, do I still have the fight in me? And you think, oh, I don't know. Sometimes I find myself saying that. I don't know. But then I stir my heart and I realise, do I still have the fight in me? And I wanna ask you, do you still have the fight in you? Do you still have the fight in you? Because in this story, This is what he's saying, don't be afraid of the enemy, but fight for your brothers and fight for your sons and fight for your daughters and fight for your sisters and fight for your homes and fight for your wives and fight for your land and fight for your country because what God is gonna do. We are not gonna let the enemy take us out. We're not gonna let him steal for us. And in this passage, there was three things happening and a little slide is gonna come up on the screen. There was three things happening. There was, I think it might come up. Does it come up behind me here? No, he, yes. Oh, look at this. They were working. They had their swords attached to them. Their shields, yes. They were working, but they were also warfaring. They were building, but they had to keep guard and keep watch. They were, um, re- they had a spirit. I'll go to the second one. They were working, they were warfaring. They were communicating. That is what we're doing today. They said, when you hear that trumpet blow, gather everybody together. Because when the trumpet sounds, we're all gonna come together. Why are we gonna come together? Because we need to keep our confidence. And I believe that is happening today. We are blowing a trumpet as we worship our God, as we lift up His Name, because God is pouring confidence back into us. And then what was happening is they had a spirit of readiness, for anything God had planned for them and a refusal to to let anything get in the way of what God had in store for them. And I wanna say to our church, this is what we must do. We must work and we must warfare. We must keep communicating, keep gathering and we must keep our confidence. And we must always have a spirit of readiness for what God has for us and a refusal to back down. And I believe that is what's happening in this story. And so my question is, do you still have the fight in you? Do you still have the fight in you, church? Do you still have the fight in you for where God is taking you? Do you still have the fight in you for the area that you're leading? Do you still have the fight in you for the business that you're building? Do you still have the fight in you to become stronger and wiser and better? Do you still have the fight in you to become a bigger person? Do you still have the fight in you to keep walking with the Spirit of God? 
Do you still have the fight in you to keep yielding to His will? Do you still have the fight in you to become more like Him? Do you still have the fight in you for the people that you're responsible for? Do you still have the fight in you for the breakthroughs that you've not yet seen yet? Do you still have the fight in you? Because this is what Nehemiah was challenging the people with. Do you still, we're gonna fight for our brothers and our sisters. We're gonna fight for the land. We're gonna fight for what God's given us. Do you still have the fight in you? Do you still have the fight in you for the unity of our church? Do you still have the fight in you for the break, for breaks? Do you still have the fight in you for breaking strongholds over cities and nations? Do you still have the fight in you for ground that needs to be taken? Do you still have the fight in you for soil that has become hard that needs to be broken up? Do you still have the fight in you for brokenness to become wholeness? Do you still have the fight in you for buildings and land and places that people can come together and worship? Do you still have the fight in you to possess what God has for you? Because I believe we've got to ask ourselves this question, do I still have the fight in me? And maybe today you've come in here and you say, maybe I don't have the fight in me. Maybe I'm middle of the road, maybe I have the fight in me, or maybe I really have the fight in me. Can I say, wherever you sit on that spectrum, I believe you're gonna walk out of here with a new fight on the inside of you. Because I believe God is renewing our fight. I believe God Himself is restoring our fight. It's not just a pump talk that can do it. It's God His Spirit Himself is coming and is restoring the fight on the inside of us. And together, we're gonna do something so incredible for the glory of God. So have you still got the fight in you? Have you still got the fight in you? Because I believe, church, there's four things we gotta keep fighting for. We can't let the enemy take it. No work and warfare, communicate confidence, re readiness, refusal. Four things that I believe we've gotta keep the fight in. Are you ready? Number one, we've got to keep fighting for our faith. Everyone say faith. Because church, look at me for a minute. If I could say one thing over the last two years that I believe the enemy has tried to steal, that is our faith. I believe he's come and he's tried to steal faith out of people's hearts. And he's tried to sow seeds of doubt. And he's tried to get people in unbelief. And he's tried to create confusion. And he's tried to create compromise. And he's tried to create mediocrity. And he's tried to water things down. And he's tried to get people becoming just average and lukewarm. And um, he's just tried to steal that mighty seed of faith that is on the inside of you. There is a lot gone on in the world in the last few years. And there's a lot gone on in, in um, the church in the last few years. And do you know what? That is the enemy's plan. Oh, now I get them. I'll get them while they're down. I'll get them at the most vulnerable and I'll steal that little seed of faith. I'll take what was there so strongly and I'll just get them to become average. Do you know what? If he can do that, he's got you. And do you know, I just feel today, church, there's gonna be nothing average about us. We are gonna be an on fire people who are radical for our Saviour. He is worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. God is stirring our faith again. And we can't let the enemy steal our faith. And that is what he's tried to do. And even in my own personal walk with God, there's been days where I felt this, like I literally felt like He was trying to steal my faith. And I would stand there and I would walk in my, I would just walk around and I'd just say to myself, I choose Him. I choose you today, Jesus. I choose you today, even if I don't feel it, I choose you. Um, he's put before us life and death and blessing and cursing. And I'm gonna choose every day who I worship. And I choose Him today. I'm not gonna let the enemy steal my faith. And I wanna say, you're not either. And do you know why He's tried to steal our faith? He's tried to steal our faith because he understands the power of our faith to change futures. Not just our future, the future of our family, the future of our families to come, the generations, cities and nations. If he can steal your faith, he's got you. That's why Hebrews 11 is such a critical scripture in the Bible. Hebrews 11, I'm not gonna read it all to you, so don't panic, not another 21 verses. However, I will show us what it says. Hebrews 11 it begins, and I'll, I will just read it and stop and tell you some things. It starts by this, faith shows the reality of what we hope for, and it is the evidence of we, what we can't see. Imagine if you lose your faith, then you lose your hope. And that's why the enemy's tried to steal your faith, because he knows if he gets your faith, he's got your hope. Then it goes on and it says, by faith we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command, and that what we now see came from nothing we can, that can be seen. What does faith do? Church, listen. Faith causes impossible things to happen. 
Faith causes things that are not created to be created. Why do you think the enemy's tried to do steal our faith? Because he's trying to get us defeated and down. But he's not gonna win. And then it goes on and it says, and by faith Enoch was taken out to heaven, up to heaven without even dying. If I disappear one day, church, just let it be. <laughs> Don't come looking for me. Don't put out a missing person. I reckon I've just gone to heaven. <laughs> Maybe do a little searching just in case. <laughs> but how amazing is this? By faith, Enoch just went up to the presence of the Lord because faith can do amazing things. And then it says, by faith, he disappeared because God took him. And before he was taken up, he was known as a man who pleased God. We can't please God in our own striving, but we can only please God by faith. See, the enemy wants to take our faith because then we can't please God. I mean, he knows what's happening here. By faith, Noah built a large boat to save his whole family. Church, did you know your faith will save an entire generation? So why does he want your faith? Because he knows then he can't, he, he's one. He knows that generations can't be changed. So we cannot give him our faith. And then it goes on and says, by faith, Abraham obeyed God. Our faith causes us to obey him. He left his land and went to where God had called him. By faith, our by faith, he was able to obey. And then it goes on in verse 11, it says, by faith, Sarah, who was not able to have a child because she was barren and was too old, actually had a child. What does our faith do? It turns barrenness into fruitfulness. Can you see, church, that he's trying to steal our faith because he understands that our faith will change the future. And then it concludes here and says, and so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. Nations were changed because of our faith. And church, I just wanna declare over your 2024 that we, have you still got the fight of faith in you? Because we're gonna be a church full of faith for what God is taking us into. Because our faith will change the future. Our faith will change your future. Our faith will change the future of our church and our faith will change the future of nations. If you believe that, can you say amen? Amen. So number one, have you still got the fight of faith in you? Number two, the second thing we need to fight is we need to fight the forces. Everyone say the forces. There's forces. Did you know there's forces out there? There's three forces that we actually need to fight. These are the forces. We need to fight the force of sin. We need to fight the force of self. And we need to fight the force of Satan. And do you know what, church? There actually is a thing called sin. And people freak out at the word sin and think, oh, what is that? Do you know all sin is is missing the mark? And God is so um, concerned with sin. Do you know why He's so concerned with sin? Not because He's concerned with us being good people or bad people. He's concerned with sin because what sin does is it separates us from God. So therefore, there can be no intimate relationship with Him. And so he's saying, hey, deal with your sin because I wanna live close to you. And do you know what? Sin is a force and all we've gotta do is going, okay, I gotta recognise it. I don't know about you, but every day I deal with sin. Little things in my heart or things I shouldn't have done or something I said that I shouldn't have said or way I acted that I shouldn't have acted. And do you know in Hebrews 12 and verse one, it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight especially, um, that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let us um, strip off every weight, especially the sin that so easily can take us out. Church, let's continue to look at what it is that's separating us from God. You know in your own heart, I know in my own heart, and I've got to keep looking at that. Let's keep dealing with the forces, the force of sin. And then there is the hardest one, the force of self. Everybody say self. I don't know about you, but myself gets in the way of a lot. And I feel like there's a scripture when I was a young girl and it's in Galatians 2 and verse 20. And it says this, it is no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer I who lives. Really? <laughs> it is no longer I who lives. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. And do you know what church? There is a thing called self. 
and it's willfulness versus willingness. And I wanna encourage our church, I'm a very willful person by nature. I'm very, um, I don't wanna admit it publicly. <laughs> I confess my sin. <laughs> but I am a very sometimes stubborn person. But you know, really, who was that? Gary, can you stand up now and confess your sin? <laughs> I am sometimes a stubborn person, but actually it served me well. Your strengths can be your weakness. But you know what? We've all got to deal with ourself at times. And we've got to die to ourself and die to our willfulness so we can fulfill His will. And church, I feel like that's a force that He's wanting to say, deal with our sin, deal with ourself. You know, we cannot really enter into everything God has for us if we do not die to ourself. And that's when everyone around you is getting praised and no one's recognizing you. Are you okay with that? Do you know when everything's happening for others and nothing's happening for you, are we okay with that? I mean, these are things for years I've spent my life dying to and I'm grateful. At the time it didn't feel good, but I'm grateful because now it's meant less of me and hopefully more of him. And that's the road I want to go on in 2024. Less of me and more of him. I'm gonna commit to dying to the force of sin and I'm gonna commit to dying to the force of self. And the third one is I'm gonna commit to not letting the force of Satan <laughs> be any part of my life. And you might think, Satan, is he real? Yes, he's real. And we need to talk about him on very limited occasions because we need to recognise that he's real and he's out to take us out and destroy us. But you know what? Greater is he that's in us. Greater is he that's in us. Greater is he. We have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. But may I read to you quickly Ephesians chapter 6 and it says this. Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. I'm gonna read it in the message. And it says, and that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, every well-made weapons of the best materials and put them to use so you will be able to stand against anything the devil throws your way. Do you know, church, there is a person called the devil. And do you know, we are gonna continue to fight that force. We're not gonna let him have his way in our hearts, in our lives, in our church. And so can I encourage us, church, keep fighting the force of um, sin, keep fighting the force of self and keep fighting the force of Satan and step into everything that you have got for you. You. Read Ephesians 6. That can be our homework as a church because it's a really, really amazing passage in the message. And take all the weapons that have been given to you, the Word of God and worship and prayer and the church and community and gathering and breaking strongholds. That is what God has got for us. And everybody said... So we're gonna keep fighting for our faith. We're gonna keep fighting the forces. And number three, we're gonna keep fighting for what is ours. Do you know, sometimes you've gotta fight for what is yours. The worship team can come and join me. Church, sometimes we've gotta fight for what is yours. Have you ever lost anything valuable? I remember once I went to a, a car, car drive through cleaner and I had an iPod, it was in South Africa. And I put this iPod under my chair and I thought, I'm gonna just hide it so no one takes it. When I went back, I hadn't been anywhere else that day, only to the car wash. When I came back to get my car, the iPod was gone. And I'm like, someone has taken my iPod. I can't believe this, because the only reason it was valuable because of the pictures that were on it back in the day. So I said to the manager, I said, someone has taken my iPod. And he's like, no, they wouldn't have. I said, no, I haven't been anywhere today. This is the only place. And he said, okay, well, let's go to the staff. So we gathered the staff and I said, I feel like someone has taken my iPod. No, no one's taken it. And I said, would you guys mind emptying out your bags? So they em a lot of stuff had been stolen previous. So I was a bit fanatical. They all emptied their bags. There's nothing there, of course. And then I said, don't worry. I just call, I'm gonna call the police. So I called the police, the police came up. Um, they said, listen, you're never gonna get this back. And I said, no, I'm gonna get it back. And he's like, no, you're not. And I said, well, let's see. So he goes, you can lodge a complaint, but it'll go nowhere. So I'm like, okay. Um, I said, do you know what we could do? We could get the lie detectors. So tomorrow we'll get the lie detectors all over an iPod. <laughs> And these people will look at me, big eyes, this woman is crazy. <laughs> but you know what? When I got back to my house that day, I got a phone call. The iPod is on the desk. 
And I went back, I picked up my iPod, I went, yes. <laughs> long story, that was a long story, very short. But it really, it made me realize, sometimes you have gotta fight for what is yours. And church, I wanna say to you, don't let things go that belong to you. Fight for what is yours. And do you know what belongs to you? The power of God belongs to you. The same, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, don't forget that. You can forget about it and think, oh, I'm just a normal person. Well, you're actually not a normal person. You've got the power and the presence of God in you. So fight for what is yours, the grace of God. The grace of God is yours, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourself, it is a free gift of God. What is God's grace? It's not just His favour and His blessing. It's far more than that. It's His power alone is on the inside of you. So fight for, fight for the grace of God. Fight for your freedom. It says he's so rich in kindness and grace, he's purchased our freedom. So fight for what belongs to you. Don't let people take your freedom. Fight for what belongs to you. Forgiveness is yours. You don't have to feel guilty or condemned or shamed because he says he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Fight for what is yours. Salvation is yours. You're saved and you're called. And his joy is yours. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Come on, church. Fight for what belongs to you. And then the peace of God. He says this amazing verse. He says, this peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It is not as the world gives to you, but... Um, it is not as the world give, gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. I mean, this is crazy. This belongs to you. And I wanna encourage our church, keep fighting for what belongs to you. Fight for your faith, fight the forces and fight for what belongs to you. And my final point is this, is fight for your fruit. Do you know what I feel like in the last few years? He's tried to steal our fruit. And then I got a revelation that He can never steal our fruit if we do not give Him our fellowship. If you give Him your fellowship, He can steal your fruit. But if you don't give Him your fellowship, He cannot steal our fruit. And so let me show you in conclusion, John chapter 15. And it says this beautiful Scripture. I would love to read it in the Passion. I am the true sprouting vine. And my farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting up and propping up this, the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitless branch to yield an even greater harvest. The words I've spoken over you have already cleansed you. As you must remain, as you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit. So your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. What an amazing scripture. Church, can I remind us today, fight for your fruit. Do you know how you fight for your fruit? You keep your fellowship. If you live in union with Him, do you know what? You don't even have to strive or struggle to be fruitful. It will just flow out of who you are. And I wanna encourage you, don't give your fruit away by not building your fellowship. And my commitment to our church is I wanna commit to keeping my fellowship with Jesus alive and real and powerful because then I believe we can be fruitful. And so church, I wanna encourage us, keep fighting for your faith. Keep fighting for your faith. Keep fighting the forces. Keep fighting for what belongs to you and keep fighting for your fruit by not giving away your fellowship. And if you believe that this morning, can you say amen?